Hi. Well, hello. Here How we are you? Are. Well, we are deep in the middle of winter, aren't we? We are, and we have a new backdrop. <laughs> new scenery. That's no cooking. Right. <laughs> no cooking. We are not going to cook today. <laughs> And if you don't know what reference that is, you might want to check back on some of our previous programs. That's right. Mary and I have had some adventures. We have. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> hair raising adventures. <laughs> you bet. And but today we're just up here at our indoor remote studio, and we're going to talk about something. Did you know anything about the gold rush in Alaska where up in the Utah, uh, Yukon and the Klondike? Well, I do remember growing up, my brother got a record album from KT Records. If you remember KT yeah, Records. Yeah, I think so. Okay, they were uh, relatively inexpen inexpensive records. And he picked up an album from a guy by the name of Johnny Horton. Oh, sure. I know what song. <laughs> and it was North to Alaska. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't really know anything all about it, but I thought, you know, this is a really interesting story, and it does actually uh, have some uh, pieces of it that is attached to Trempolo County. You know, so a little tie my, back. Yes. And this is a good time of year. Yes, it is. Yeah. And before we go any farther... I'm calling my dog because I don't know what she's doing in there. Zip? <laughs> Zip? Unfortunately, Zip is having the uh, uh, cabin fever Zip. symptoms. <laughs> and so we may need to uh, uh, you know, break tape. Nancy's got to go find the dog. Zip, come on, what are you doing? And she's a shredder. She likes to read the newspaper. Um, she... Uh, uh, just about anything she can get her grubby little paws on grubby is little, fair game. Grubby little teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Zip. People I haven't seen you in a while. Come on up here. Oh, here we go. Now we've got the swamp yeah. dog. Yes. Yeah. She's about like a two-year-old. If you, if you don't, yes. if you can't hear anything and you can't see her, then you know that she is up to no good. That's right. <laughs> That's right. You know, Nancy, I wonder if she could be a mush dog. Well... That's kind of interesting. We'll bring that up, too. <laughs> Come on down. <laughs> oh, All right. Oh, everybody likes down. a hug from the dog Get in down. the winter. Okay. And we also yeah, want to say, if you hear a little tick, tick, tick in the background, that's not my heartbeat. That is my kitchen timer. That's because we're not in the studio. That's and we right. don't have people running around with showing us how much time we have here. So if you hear clicking, that's what it is. So we're going to talk a little bit about this gold rush, and it it happened. It, it started in 1896, and okay. at that time, there was a depression going on in the in the in the county. Yeah, but it, I mean, in the country, in, in the country, and not as not as bad as the one in you know the 1930s. But it was a depression, and jobs were tough, and people were having a hard time. So. Um, and like I say, in 1896, there were three men that got off a steamship that was coming down from Alaska. What? That's my phone. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Another interruption. That's okay. We'll, we'll have to start over. <laughs> so we were saying that in 1896, a steamer came down the west coast from Alaska okay. to Seattle and had three men on there. And with them, they had bags of, of gold. Oh, so they were lucky. They had struck gold up in the Klondike in Alaska. These three guys, uh, was a man by the name of George Carmack, and then he had um, two brother-in-laws with him, and they were uh, Native Americans called Skookum Jim, and uh, Dawson Charlie. Oh, okay. But they had found gold up there on the Klondike. And so when they came into <laughs> Seattle, it caused a stir. Mainly because, you know, in the papers, most of the uh, news had been bad. It was about this depression. And all of a sudden, here was this gold was found. Wow. Yes. And it set off, like we say, a major, major gold rush. 
you know, we always think of the gold rush in California, and that was, what, 1849. Right, right. Well, here came another opportunity, and it was an opportunity at a time, like I say, when people were having a hard time financially, wow. and here was this chance that if they could get up there to the gold fields and get some of this gold, all their problems would be <laughs> over, you know. <laughs> so those fellows that were, were the first ones kind of in and out of yeah. Alaska... They're the expedists behind the gold rush. Yes, they didn't keep it quiet. Let's put it that way. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. And uh, so this set off all of a sudden, uh, you know, the, the papers were running all these 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 big headlines about this gold rush, gold from the Yukon River, half a million worth, you know, dollars worth of gold and everything. And, and <laughs> so... This was, like I say, the summer of 1896, and it set off this incredible, we well, I have to call it a stampede. Yeah. Because that's what they call these men that went up there. They called them stampeders. Oh, okay. Yeah. And they figured there was 100,000 men and a few women that went up there looking for gold, and most of them had no idea what they were doing. Well, and they're going to Alaska. <laughs> right. I mean, from continental United States, right. that is a completely different universe. Well, and they didn't know anything how many about froze. They didn't know anything <laughs> about mining. They didn't know what it entailed. They just knew that if they could get up there first and get out there and find some gold, they would figure it out. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well, and think about the wildlife. I mean, they had to encounter wolves and bears well, and. It was big, scary things that go thump in the night. It was pretty <laughs> amazing. See up. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it was, but I don't think any of them even thought of that. I think they just went up there in this real haze, this yes. real bubble that they had to get up there and get the gold. And we're going to get rich yeah. quick. And the gold, I think they really thought it was just going to be laying around on top of the ground, and, and that wasn't. How it was it? No, no. Gold mining is, especially when you're taking out taking it out of waters, extremely difficult process. So, uh, what really happened because they had come down to Seattle was with this gold boom and all these people rushing to the West Coast and trying to get you know they had to take a boat up to Alaska. There wasn't any Alaskan highway or anything trans. No. Alaskan no. Highway at that time. If you wanted to get up there, you pretty much had to take a boat. And um, it, it kind of made Seattle, because Seattle at that time was, wasn't a very big town. It was probably about like Winona. Right, right. And, and after this, it really took off. However, the mayor of Seattle quit his job to join the, <laughs> the gold <laughs> rush. <laughs> so you can so see. when Johnny Horton said... You know, north to Alaska, the rush is on. He wasn't just kidding, was he? No. There was like 2,000 men a day well, hopping ships and heading north. And, um, excuse me, I don't know what my dog is chewing on now. She's chewing on a piece of paper that she took from mm -hmm. the paper box. Oh All right. <laughs> and hope, I'm hopefully not going to look. <laughs> it's not important. <laughs> so... So what they had to do was they had to take a steamer up the west coast there uh, of Alaska, and they got off at, at a place called, uh, they were trying to get to the Klondike, the Yukon area, and uh, they had to get to this little town called Skagway. Okay, I've heard of Skagway. Yep, Skagway is still there, but that was where all these, all these miners rushed to, and so... It wasn't like the gold wasn't in Skagway. It was a long ways away. It was hundreds of miles. And so they had to figure out how they were going to get there. Oh, with their supplies. Look at all of the supplies. Holy cats. Well, the Klondike and the part where the gold was actually found was actually in the Yukon, which is Canadian. Oh, so they actually had to cross They had east. to get up there. What they had to do was to get to the Yukon River. And then the Yukon River flows north, and then it goes down to the, I, I, you know, the, the ocean there. Yep. It comes out by Nome, I guess. That's what they had to do, and I don't know how many of them even knew that that's what they had to do. But it entailed a lot of supplies. And so when they got to Skagway, that was like number two. First they went up 
up the coast and then they got to Skagway and then they had to go over mountains to get to Lake Bennett which was uh, kind of where it was like the headwaters of the Yukon River. So this enormous tent camp at the foot of the mountains in Skagway wow. sprung up and then the uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police said that people that were coming up there into Canada, they had to have at least a thousand pounds of supplies. Oh, I suppose, because where, where are you going to get your food sources? And it wasn't just food. I saw a list of all the things that people were supposed to bring. You know, it was pickaxes and, and it was a whole list of stuff that they had to have where they would not let them into Canada. So <laughs> what happened, and, and this is kind of a map that shows um, the route that they took. Yes, they had to go up the coast here and get to um, Skagway, and then they had to get over the Chillicoot Pass and get down by Lake Bennett. So it was not like just get off the boat and s stroll to the, <laughs> to the coal yeah. fields. Look at I found it. Yeah. It's right here, 20 feet away from where we took port. So they had to start out of Skagway and go over this, what they call the Chillicoot Pass. And this this is a picture of these <laughs> people going out there. It looks like the one guy is carrying a boat. Yeah, look, it is. Yep. It is a boat. And they had, to, like I say, they had to get a thousand, you know, pounds of, of, they had to get all these materials before they could, wow. before Canada would let them in and go down the other side. And so what they would do is they had to start carrying stuff up the hill. And it was... Uh, you know, they figured most people, even if they were big, strong young men, could probably only, you know, carry maybe 45 to 50 pounds at a time. Right, because they're on foot and right. they're walking in the snow and ice. And they are going up a hill. If they're going a mountain. This, this Not pass. a hill, a mountain. <laughs> I have, it said it was 35 miles long. This, oh, my goodness. This Chillicoot Pass. And it was, uh, it was a 45 degree Angle. slope. Oh, my goodness. Yes, and there were like... Um, there were like steps cut in the uh, the snow that they went up. Wow. But I wonder, well, I suppose it would get packed like ice, but then you're walking on well, ice steps. It was slippery. Look at these people oh going up there. Yeah, you'd need a pickaxe just to hang on to yeah. the side of the mountain. And it, just, it wasn't just one trip. If they were going to get up there to Canada, they meant making several trips to get all their supplies because at the top of the pass, which was the dividing line between the U.S. and Canada, they would have to pile their stuff and there was the Mounties were up there and they would watch these piles for people and when they had enough, then they would let them go down the other oh side. Oh my goodness. So you had to go up and down that 35 yeah. mile an hour, 35 yeah. mile I mean, Look track. at them going up there. It's just incredible. And, and they line. said... That if you got tired going up there, or, or you slipped, or you had to drop out a line, you were sunk because people weren't going to let you back in the line. Wow. They were, people were just crazed about getting Man's up there. inhumanity to man. <laughs> kick, them, kick them to the curb. It was. They just No backsies. Back to the end of the line. <laughs> Look at them going up here. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Now, there was another pass. And uh, I think it was called the Dead Horse Pass. Oh, that doesn't give you a good connotation, no, it does it? even <laughs> worse. It wasn't quite as steep, but it was very, very narrow, and there were big boulders, and it was uh, avalanches, and so it was really, this was the easy way. <laughs> wow. And, you know, I noticed that there was no, you know, beasts of burden, no pack animals, nope. no horses, because how are you going to feed them in the middle of the Alaskan yeah. wilderness? In the mountains. And you couldn't really take dog sleds up there, not the way this was. It yeah. was like steps. Well, and that's almost, I know usually when they mush dogs, it's on pretty level ground. They're not climbing mountains with them, you know. No, no. And and it was just men hauling stuff up. There was, wasn't I wonder any easy how, way. Well, how many loads... If they're carry, if they're carrying forty, let's we'll give them the benefit of the doubt because the World War Two soldiers, they could have to carry a sixty pound right. pack. Yeah. So how how many times well, would you have to go up and down that dugway? Because that's <laughs> going to be, you know, after thousands and thousands of people, that's going to be a dugway. How many loads would it take? 
Well, I said it, it took most people three months to get all their supplies up to the top oh of the pass, gosh. and then the Canadian Mountie said, okay, you can go down oh the other side. So it pretty much took them all winter and into uh, 1897. Mm, just to get there. Yes, and of course the people that were making a lot of money at this point were the people in Skagway that were selling the supplies. <laughs> They were entrepreneurial shit right. at its finest. That's right. Well, just imagine how the city was overwhelmed because it was really one of the very few ports. Right. And all of a sudden you've got thousands and thousands of people right. coming into town. And, I mean, where do you put everybody? Like you said, a there, tent city. There was a tent city. So they say out of 100,000, they figure like 40,000 of those actually made it all the way. Up over the hill and down to what they call Lake Bennett. And Lake Bennett was a lake that was kind of at the head of the Yukon River. Well, they still had to go another 300 miles down the Yukon River to get to the Klondike where the gold, the gold, gold veins strike were. had been made. Oh, my goodness. So they, okay, they're over the, <laughs> they're over the pass. And so now what are they going to do? Well... You've got all these supplies you've got to take with you. So oh people my. started making rafts and boats. Okay. Gee whiz. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, wants to go north to Alaska. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that might be a good workout for her. So they were going, they ended up actually denuding the slopes oh, of trees there. Taking all the trees. To make boats, and of course they needed fuel to keep warm and oh, everything. Yeah, it's cold, it's Alaska. Yeah. And we're dangerous too, because there had been a couple avalanches that had wiped out a bunch of people that were going up that Chilliput Pass. Oh, wow. And they said the, the snow was like 70 feet deep. Wow, that's unreal. Yeah, so... This getting to this uh, Lake Bennett, that was that was really a, mir something. a miracle in <laughs> itself. It was. So then, most of them didn't know anything about making boats or anything, but they started sawing up logs and, and trying to make rafts and you know something that would get them down the river. You know, the river at this time was frozen, and oh so they were boy. they had to get it ready by the time you know that the ice came out of the river and then it was going to be like everybody was going to be headed for the gold field now this picture is actually of uh, the other pass this uh, dead horse pass and, and here it doesn't look quite as steep but they said it was actually harder and much more treacherous so there just wasn't any easy way to get over to uh, the Yukon River it was, unreal it was tough no wonder so many people <laughs> dropped out and you know the, probably the sad part about this Nancy is they've got people back in the states who probably have no idea what their family member no. is experiencing because they're thinking any minute they're going to show back up with a big old basket of gold right, right. and we're going to get new dresses Woo! save the farm you know we're going to buy some more cows unreal <laughs> unreal so okay they, they they started making these boats and rafts and eventually spring came uh, quite late as it does in Alaska when you're that far north. Right. By this time they were actually in the Klondike and, and they were in uh, Canada. Okay. So then they set out down the river once the ice went off. They said it was this mad scramble to get these supplies and people on these little boats and rafts. They said there were like a hundred of them going down this <laughs> river. Well, what turned out was this river was not real easy to navigate. It isn't like, you know, floating down from Winona to La Crosse. Okay, okay. It was uh, a lot of twists and turns, and even though it wasn't real deep, they said it had a lot of bad rapids and boulders. Well, the, those... That river was fed by mountain water. Right. And when, ice melted ice. And when you get 70 <laughs> feet of snow that starts to melt, you can't tell me. I mean, we see what the Elk Creek does to Independence when it floods. Yeah. You know. Yeah, right. <laughs> you, you know. I mean, really, how much water goes down through that river. So you know there's going to be boulders. And flash floods. And like I say, these most of these people didn't know anything about, you know, navigating a river and and uh, like water rafting. Right, they didn't know anything about it, and so there were a lot of tragedies. People that drowned, and at uh, one point they were even trying to get like a, a steam, a small steamship down there, and that 
got turned sideways and went over. So that reduced the number of people. They figured there were 40,000 people trying to get down this river. By the time that whole thing was over, they thought there was like 30,000 people left that were still that stampeding to the gold. That actually <laughs> were survived part right. of the trip. Right. Oh, my goodness. Mary, we're going to pause here for just a minute while I put my dog out because she is just cruising for <laughs> trouble. She is really <laughs> enjoying her time today Come on the History Come Files. On. Come on. Come on. Oh, yeah, she's finding all kinds of goodies to get into trouble with. question is, does she ever catch a bird if she's chasing birds? Ah, uh, not very often. She just likes to see them go in the air. Yeah. yeah. She can't jump that high. No. No. But, <laughs> you know, she, <laughs> she took her photo bombs. She did good today. Oh, Nancy. yeah. She didn't, can totally tear up the house. <laughs> so now back to the Con Klondike. When they got, um, the ones that managed to make it down the river, they came to this place that was called Dawson or Dawson City. Okay. And at the time, it was just like a little trading post for trappers and that. And all these stampeders. Oh boy! Here we converged go on it, and it became a boom city. Like overnight, it went from having just a few hundred people to having tens of thousands of people. Oh wow! And this was Dawson City, and uh, it is still there today. But it's quite small. It's like Skagway. And I think it's mainly kept alive by uh, tourism. People okay. that want to come up and see where the gold rush Where the gold rush happened. Right. And again, is the people that were really making money at this time are the people that were, you know, they had restaurants, they were running right. hotels, they were running dance halls, they were women of virtuous, you know. Oh. Of uh, questionable uh, virtue. Uh, alternative lifestyles. Right. <laughs> it was all going on here. And it was just a wide open, wild city. Um, how did they get, how did the merchants get supplies in? Was that all from the Canadian side? Yeah, I think it probably, a lot of it maybe came up the Yukon River. These people at that time were going down, but they came up. And also by, right here by a dog sled. Yep, there we go. There's yep. the mushers. And they said at that time there was such a demand for sled dogs that people in the United States were having their dogs stolen. Oh, wow. And it takes a special dog to pull a sled. Yeah, I mean, they weren't being pulled by, you know, a bunch of dog sounds. Mm, border collies. <laughs> yeah, they were bigger dogs, you know, and uh, they would get... They would bring big money. They would get stolen and shipped up there, and the next thing you know, they were pulling sleds. Unreal. So that was a big deal. Um, <coughs> because once they got to Dawson, it was like 500 miles down the river from Lake Bennett until okay. they finally got to Dawson. And Dawson became this incredible boom town, and uh, just overnight, it, it just really took off. And... Uh, it was, uh, like I say, it was just a wide open place. And with all these thousands of people in Dawson, there was no sanitation. Oh, I bet you there was no law enforcement either. Not much. You know, people were gambling and drinking and just having a good old time. Well, and probably pilfering each other's <laughs> hordes of sure. gold chips that they found in the river. It was pretty wide open town. But at least the ones that got to Dawson, then they were going out to these um, gold fields. There were different creeks that you were supposed to be able to go up, and that was where you could get gold. However, almost all of them were tragically disappointed because they found that people had already filed on this land. Oh, this is where it gets complicated. This is like what they say, the rubber hits the road because... That paperwork. People had already taken up claims there, and there really wasn't hardly anything available. So about all they could do was go to work for somebody that already had a claim. Oh, and there goes there goes the dream of there goes part. I mean, there's the moon. It rich. The moon gets bricked. <laughs> up. Some more air goes out of it, and they did not find gold just laying around on top. Like you know, they figured that that was you know it's going to be easy. You just go right, out there right. and pick it up. What they had to do was they found out that the gold was actually down um, in the creek beds. It was in the permafrost. Oh. 
So what they had to do was they had to dig down as far as 100, you know, feet. Wow. And then they would dig out this permafrost, you know, it was like a shale. Right. And then they would bring it up to the top, and then they would store it, and then when they had time, they would start, you know, doing the sluicing, the panning. Okay. Where they would try to figure out, you know, find, you know, the gold dust and, and the gold chunks. Like, right there, there's yeah. the guy panning for gold. We've all heard about that. Rinsing off the permafrost yeah. and the soil and the dirt and everything in it and trying to shake yeah. it out. you did it a certain way and, and you know, you, you if you did wow. it right and you hit a good place, then you could hopefully wind up with something like this. You struck a vein. But this is interesting. At this time, the price of gold was way down. It was like $15 an ounce. Wow, because I would assume that the market was flooded with gold. Well, they hoped so. They hoped it would be. And I think right now gold for, goes for like $750 an ounce. Oh. And back here it was for $15. <laughs> I mean, even when you uh, factor in inflation, that was still you know quite a... So I meant they had to really mine a lot of... Well, I should go see if I could have any gold jewelry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh. It meant that you really had to mine a lot of gold if you were going to make any money. If you were going to make it big. If you were going to be able to pay off the, you know, all the expenses of getting up there. Well, and just the time. I mean, how far does it take you to travel 500 miles? Yeah. Either on frozen ice sheet, right? when the river was frozen yeah. or on a cobbled together homemade boat I mean it took had to take them nine months to get to where they were going well I think altogether it did and uh, they said that in Dawson City I mean they did wow. start finding gold but it wasn't usually big chunks it was more like gold dust okay flakes and people had these little sacks they called them pokes that they would get their gold dust in. And then that was the currency in, in uh, Dawson City. They said all the merchants would have these little scales out there on the counter. And when you wanted something, you had to pay for it with ounces of gold. You sprinkled out your money. Right, and right. <laughs> they weighed it. Wow. It'd take a while to get through the store today if you had to do that, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tap, tap, tap. No, we need two more flakes. And they said that, the guy that really made the money was a guy that brought over the Chilkoot Pass. He brought over a couple of brooms. Brooms? He made all this money. Uh, he hired himself out to uh, sweep out establishments. What and, a unique idea. And the, the kicker was he had the rights to whatever the floor sweepings were. And by doing <laughs> that, he found enough gold dust and once in a while little gold nuggets and things that he wound up a very rich man. Good for him. <laughs> now that's real thinking. It yeah. is. Yeah. It yeah. is. It's it kind is. of like running a vacuum at a casino, <laughs> right? Yeah. After, yeah. after big money night. <laughs> and they also talked about uh, some of these bartenders, you know, that when the guys came and paid for it with gold dust and they would have to measure it out. The one guy would lick his fingers while he was doing it and then he'd run his fingers through his hair oh. and at the end of the day he would go wash his hair and then there'd be gold dust coming out. Special kind of dandruff. <laughs> <laughs> so people got pretty inventive. Wow. <laughs> and there were other people that made money by having like restaurants or places where they could stay. I mean, legitimate. Right. Legitimate business opportunities. But, you know, like you said, innovation. Yeah. And it, there wasn't a lot of food up there. There just wasn't. And what happened in uh, the winter of, like, 1997 and part of 98 was the supplies of food in Dawson City really got low, and most people were existing on beans. Oh, boy. Yeah, they didn't even have flour. So then what happened? They started getting scurvy. Oh my goodness, and here we go. Overpopulation, no food. Bad sanitation, and then and you are getting sick with scurvy, which is a terrible thing. It makes your teeth fall out. Oh, unreal. Yeah, it was rough. Uh, and the ones that made it through again and kept on, you know, hammering away trying to find something here. And the prices, they said, were like it was $2 for an egg. 
An egg? One egg. Five dollars oh. for a gallon of milk. Yeah, well, where would you have cows? How oh, would you yeah, feed right. cows? <laughs> right. I mean, I think of what our cows go through in the winter time. <laughs> wow. I know that's a lot of money. Well, and I suppose if the cow got dry, then the cow got turned into lunch. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm sure it was. That is unreal. So here's all these guys mining away. Here's the guy. Looks like that. That's the kind of sled dog they wanted. These big, strong dogs, you know. And can you imagine living up there in a in a tent? And I'm sure it got pretty darn cold oh, there in I the bet. winter. Look at that. So they were some rough old timers here. They, they called them the Stampeders. And they had to be hardy if yeah. they were going to survive. Yeah. If they got, if they actually went through all that thing of going from Skagway over the pass and then down the river and they got to Dawson and then they got back up to these, these different claims, uh, they, by that time I would assume that they were really starting to figure things out. Right, right. That this was a cold climate. Yeah. And um, so they got to be some pretty hardy souls, I guess. Well, and you wonder what the overall death toll was, you know. Well, I mean, to have that. And then how many people just went and just disappeared. Well, and, and turned back or died like in an avalanche or from sickness or yeah. fights. I mean, Dawson was a pretty rough place. Yeah, it's so portrayed in the movies as uh, rough and tumble. And Lots of guns. What the Canadians did do was they tried to keep mail going, you know, mail between Dawson City okay. and down uh, to more settled areas. And usually the people that did that were mushers. They yep. did that by, by dogs, and it took a long time. It wasn't just a couple miles down the river. It right. was quite a route. But uh, <laughs> the dogs were very important, at least when they had the snow. And in the summer, they had the problems with um, bugs, you know, like oh. mosquitoes and gnats. And, and they spread all kinds of things, too. Oh, yeah. It in, was not pleasant. In rough conditions. Well, then along came 1899, and all of a sudden, the news came that there had been a new gold strike at Nome. Oh, <laughs> now we're moving on. <laughs> so that meant all of a sudden all these guys were picking up everything they owned and trying to get on a boat to go all the way down the river to Nome, Unreal. Alaska. And they said there they thought they would have an easier time because they said actually the gold dust was um, on the shores. Oh, okay. I guess that, I mean, that's part of the Arctic Sea or the Bering Strait. Right. But uh, that, then you really couldn't claim that, so they had better chances, they thought. Of getting something. So all these tens of thousands of people, like you can see, crammed onto these boats to get down to Nome. Unreal. <laughs> so by 1900, Dawson, which had had, you know, like what they say, you know, tens of thousands of people, had pretty much become a, a ghost town. Yeah. <clears throat> and that was kind of the end of the of the big Klondike gold rush. That's just incredible, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and it did have one thing that, uh, you know, it had some good things and bad things. Uh, the good thing was that the gold and finding the gold kind of helped the economy in the United States and Canada. Uh, the bad thing was, who really took it on the chin with this, were the Native Americans yep. that lived up there. And also uh, the ecology and yeah. nature, really. First, they took all the timber down right. to make the boats. And then when they did get down there to Dawson and out up these little creeks, things got really polluted. Oh, yeah, because people are they're in the water. They're digging in the permafrost. Right. They're bringing things up from way down deep. Yeah. And, you know, erosion. You know, we talk about erosion all the time. Just that, that's probably why Nome had the stray because all that gold dust filtered down through the river. <laughs> it was it was just a you know and, and today there are still some gold mines up there. Oh, but they're big. I mean, they're not guys out there with a pan for the most right. part. Right, <laughs> right. They, they're big operations with big heavy yeah. equipment, and it's tough going. They don't make a huge amount of money. Um, you know, mining way up in the Arctic is not real pleasant. There was that uh, TV show that was so popular about the ice road truckers. Yeah. 
And I think that's what they were doing where they were hauling supplies up to some of these mines way up there. Back and forth. Yeah. Across frozen oceans. Yeah. <laughs> Unreal. So now we have to say, how did this impact Trempeleau County? Well, <clears throat> it was interesting because we know of at least four men that left Trempeleau County and headed up there for the gold fields. Really? Yes. Four? Yep. And uh, their names were uh, Omer Immel and Thomas Johnson. Okay. And Halder Loken and James Nelson. The four of them went up there together and they said... That when they, you know, they were young guys, this Loken, he was only 17. Wow. And he was actually the brother-in-law of Thomas Johnson, who had a wife. And I'm thinking, wow, this wife, she's watching these, you know, her, her yeah. little brother and her husband disappear on this gold thing. But when they left Blair, they said there was a lot of people that, you know, saw them off. and Cheered them on. Go! Right. Yeah. So I suppose if you were a young guy... And you had some ambition, and things weren't good around here. You thought, why not? Yeah. <laughs> Roll up your sleeves and <laughs> let's give it a north. try. <laughs> let's give it a try. <laughs> there was a pretty interesting old article I found. <clears throat> this was from 1952. And it talked about the death, this was in 1952, of uh, James Nelson. He was the last survivor of a group of four Trumple County men who went to Alaska during the gold rush. Uh -huh. Well, I was next to the last survivor. The last survivor was a man by the name of Thomas Johnson of Fly Creek. And it said, uh, it talked about Halder Loken and Omer Immel going up there. Mr. Immel uh, died in Blair, and I think that was so, oh, like in the 1940s. And he had gone up there, but he had returned almost immediately to Blair. Okay. And in looking at his, um, his, his, uh, History at you know, his obituary, Mr. Immel, uh, he was quite a um, oh a conservationist oh, and noted okay. for um, uh, he was quite a sportsman and was real involved with things like that. Uh, and Mr. Uh, Nelson, it said that uh, Mr. Johnson stayed a few years, and then but Mr. Logan, this young guy, he was only 17 when he went up there. He stayed uh, at Carmax, Alaska, until his death. Oh wow! But none of them struck it rich mining. None oh. of them did, no. However, that would have been a great ending <laughs> to have them, somebody strike it I rich. No. But at least they got a resident, right? Yes. And James Nelson went on to become, uh, he was quite famous as a teamster. Uh, so he, uh, he uh, was, got a contract for running the mail up there. Wow. And he used, like, whatever he could. In the summer, he was using things like uh, mules. And in the winter, he was he was out there mushing. He there had you dogs. go. Yeah, so. Fell in love with Alaska. Yep, he made his money that way. Uh, and Mr. Loken became a well-known guide on the big game hunts up in the Yukon River. Wow, that is a neat, <laughs> yeah. neat story. And it said that... Um, Mr. Loken, uh, it was one on one of these trips where he was actually hauling mail as well by dog team, that he found the body of this young Native American uh, woman who had died of the cold, and when he went, you know, to look at her body, he found out that she had she was had a little baby, and the little baby was still alive. Wow! So he took the baby with him and raised it. And, oh, uh, how awesome. Yeah, and eventually this uh, little baby that became like his adopted son helped him with his, uh, you know, with his guiding and everything. Oh, wow. Yeah. How yeah. cool is that? Yep. And he, uh, he had a 220-mile mail road oh my down the Yukon River to, Yoss, to Dawson and, re and in return, which he made with a gasoline launch. Okay. So he learned how to get up and down there. That river. That river. That's incredible. <laughs> and um, he said that usually, you know, they, they would tow a barge behind these launches that had supplies and things in it, too. And the river was, was hard, and uh, it ran, they said, they figured, what was it, 40 miles an hour, 
Wow, that's fast. And uh, but he and Mulkin and his adopted son became experts at being able to guide people and to get up and down the to river and over the rapids, which is really something to learn how to maneuver that. Yep. Wow, that is incredible. It said that Mr. Lolkin studied the wildlife of the region, and he learned where the big game hunting was, and he followed a water route north into the wilds, taking with him parties of wealthy game hunters from the states, and each trip required several weeks. Wow. So he became this famous big <laughs> game, game guy. <laughs> game hunter. That and is cool. He also became an authority on ballistics, they said. Oh, well, I think you would have to, living in the Alaskan wilderness. Yes. He was entertained by hunting arms manufacturers and by a wealthy New Yorker, and he made a reputation as being you know, interested in, in hunting rifles and things like this. So wow. he did pretty well. And... Um, yeah, he he lived in Alaska. He did come back down here once in a while, but for the most part, he stayed up in Alaska. And uh, it said that a few realized their dreams of wealth, but the majority uh, never found, you know, they worked on hoping they were going to find something, but they really never did. Right. And the hopeful ones that could earn enough in the winter by trapping to spend the summer panning gold and when a prospector reached the age where they could no longer search for the precious uh, metal, then they could probably live like this old guy here, you know, trapping and, and uh, doing some hunting and anticipating finding maybe enough, a uh, few gold nuggets and enough gold dust that they could buy some flour. They could <laughs> survive. Oh my goodness. But the real interesting guy was this Tom Johnson, and he was the one that was... Uh, the brother-in-law to Loken. Okay. He had a wife called Julia Loken, uh, and and uh, he did come back, and he never did, you know, he didn't strike it rich. I think he'd gone up there, they said, with like $1,200, and he came back with $300. Okay, <laughs> like so. He didn't make it back, yes. Yeah. And he did different things over the years. Um, he had a wife and a daughter. Unfortunately, they both died. Um, he was a tavern keeper. And when he got elderly, guess where he went to live? Alaska. No. No. Little Chicago. Really? <laughs> no. So, so, we, we, toured little, we toured Little Chicago earlier this year. You remember from one of our, our yes. past programs, we talked about Little Chicago, which was supposedly this ridge up there between Fly Creek and Fitch Cooley and Voss Cooley. And it's funny how many people remember Little Chicago. I had down the courthouse the other day, and I told them I was working on this, and this guy had lived up there in Little Chicago. And here's all these people. Oh, I know where that was. I know where that was. <laughs> Why? Because it was a big party ground. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's where they had parties. But there were also three old bachelors living up there in, in little huts. Uh, there were the two Anderson brothers, and then there was this Mr. Johnson. Johnson. Wow. So this was... Uh, and we saw a remnant building up there that was quite, quite old, but really didn't yeah. know what we, it was. We don't really know where, you know, Little Chicago, I, I don't know where it was. So but is this him? No. No. This is a guy by the name of Jack London, and he was a pretty famous author, and he had gone up there. He had not found any gold, but he ended up writing books about. Okay. And I don't know if you've ever listened to him or not. He's got a couple of really good ones. One is called um, The Call of the Wild. Yeah. And another one's called White Fang. Yes. And they're good books. I mean, yeah, they were written back here in 1900, but they're but they're really good, good. Especially uh, Call of the Wild is about a dog that got kidnapped from Seattle and taken up there to be a sled dog and it's really interesting and really readable so this was Jack London and he was noted for his stories about the Yukon and Unreal. yeah and I you know I've been trying to find out when this Tom Johnson died and I just haven't been able to you know track it down he was alive into the to the 50s anyway into the 1950s and it says up on the ridge in a spot as wild and isolated as any hermit could wish are three tiny shacks occupied by two bachelors and one widower. And 
this Tom Johnson was was the widower, and he said uh, he was 80 years old and wow. too old to toil. He spends much of his time just sitting and thinking of the days when, as a young man, he joined the feverish gold rush to the Klondike in Alaska, Unreal. and with visions of striking it rich in a hurry, which unfortunately didn't happen. Wow. Yeah. And uh, it talked about he, how he went up there with Halder Loken. And again, I think, wow, it's really something for that wife of his to be able to say goodbye to her I know. brother and her husband. And they're taking off for the Klondike. <laughs> yeah. Points unknown. No kidding. Um, it said after returning to Blair, Mr. Johnson was in the saloon business. And he had a cranberry marsh near Prey. Okay. Yeah. Yep, used to hear. And his wife, Julia, died, and his daughter, Mrs. Harry Miller of Fairchild, also died. And all he had left was a sister, uh, Isabel Meyer, living in Hayward, so he was pretty much by himself. So he settled on this spot on Fly Creek Ridge, and uh, he said the atmosphere didn't quite take him back to Alaskan days because he said it was a lot harder up there, (laughs) life. But he said... Where he was living, and like I said, this was the 1950s, he said, well, he did see an occasional deer. An but occasional deer. Back then, that was a big thing. It was. Yes. It yes. was. And um, it said that uh, he had uh, been born in Norway and come here, and uh, he had been out in the Dakotas, but finally he wound up near Blair because he had some relatives here. And, you know, living in Blair is a little easier than the Dakotas. <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah. this is nuts. And Tom said that neighbors take him to town once a month or so, so he can buy supplies. And he said he gets along comfortably with bacon and salt pork, and has plenty to eat in his shack. So I don't really know when he died, but when this no. when this article came out, he was already eighty years old. And so maybe I'll track it down. The trouble is, it's a pretty common name, Tom Johnson. Yeah. Even today, there's lots of Tom Johnsons. Yeah. So maybe someone that's watching this and knows, maybe they remember something, the stories about little Chicago and the people living up there. Wow. Maybe somebody even remembers this little guy. That is just yeah. unreal. So we know there were at least four people from this county that were stampeders that went up there to the big gold rush. And there might be others. Maybe people that are watching this say, yeah, I had a great uncle or whatever that went up there it'd be fun yeah. it'd be fun to hear about it that is just incredible yeah it is but uh i really didn't know much about this gold rush till i started getting my notes together for this and i was like oh my gosh well <laughs> and even in that time period nancy going from trumple county wisconsin to seattle how you yeah. know that had that in itself was probably longer than the four and a half hours it takes by airplane today. Yeah, it was just like they say, they figure 100,000 people rushed up there, stampeded up there, and then the numbers kind of kept getting whittled down, like this, yeah. trying to get over that pass to, to uh, Lake Bennett. That wiped out a, you know, quite a few people I'm not right going. There. I'm not going up that hill. Uh, I just can't imagine when you see that picture of them going up that hill with those packs. Well, and how, again, how many times would you have to go back and forth? Well, if you had 1,000 pounds and you could carry maybe 50 pounds at a time, yeah, that's, figure it out. That's, that's a, a lot. lot. <laughs> it was a lot of trips. and some 35 people, miles worth. Some people had enough money that they could hire people to do it for them. Yeah. And it was usually Native Americans. But still, most people had to do it themselves, and, right. and they were in just such a rush to get over there. That is incredible. Calling it the gold rush was a really good description. <laughs> it it was a rush. <laughs> and then going down that river on all kinds of rafts and boats, and a lot of that wiped out and a bunch of people ice. right there. Oh, and imagine how they denuded the environment. Yeah, they were not good to the environment. That wasn't what they were worried about. They were worried about getting up there and getting out there. The greed. To the creeks and... Uh, getting rich yeah. quick. And it said some of these people that did find gold, some of them would come into Dawson and they would lose it all in a night or two. Of oh, gambling. Heavy partying. <laughs> heavy partying. Well, you know, you drop your satchel on the floor, somebody's going to pick it up. <laughs> And uh, there weren't a lot of millionaires that came out of this rush. 
And the three people that had originally found the gold, is Carmax and his two uh, brother-in-laws, they wound up with nothing. They just, they went broke. They partied it away? Um, yeah, or they just didn't know how to handle it. Yeah. Well, you hear that, people who run into, you know, they call it new money. Yeah. And they go crazy and they spend it all. and Yeah, they, they didn't come down and make wise investments anyway. <laughs> Just like the people up there in Dawson City. Have you ever been to Alaska? I have not. Have you? No, and I would love to. I would love to see Alaska. And there are trips that you can take um, up north, of that, what they kind of call the Northwest Passage, passage up yeah. there north of Seattle. And these cruise ships do let people uh, go out and look at Skagway. And now there are roads up there, too. Right. I think you can actually drive up to Dawson City, although I wouldn't do it in the winter. Uh, probably no, not. No. And there are some pictures on the Internet of people actually walking this Chillicoot Pass. However, it's in the summer. Well, I bet you it would have to be yeah. if you were going to survive <laughs> the 35-mile-an-hour trip. That would be like walking to Eau Claire, right? Lacrosse um, is about... Yeah, and uphill on these little steps, these icy steps. Carrying <laughs> carrying a big pack that, oh, imagine. Imagine how, A, they probably had on 20 pounds of clothes. Yeah, because it wasn't, it wasn't warm. Yeah, I mean, they didn't have thin, salate gloves no, and they said, back in know, the day. It got cold up there. In the winter. It gets cold around here in the winter, but it really got cold up there. It was way below zero. Well, like 50 below zero. Yeah, and these people, a lot of these people, they they didn't have any idea what was you know needed of them. So uh, it's, it's pretty amazing that anybody made it at all, really. Well, and it's just a miracle that one of our local fellas saved a baby. Yeah. In the middle of yeah, a... Yeah, it's a neat story. And he probably... I mean, what would a a man... I mean, unless he's been exposed to children, what would he know about an infant? I and he know. probably hardly had enough supplies for himself. Maybe maybe he found someone to take care of him until he got a little older. Yeah. I don't know, but it, it's, it's an incredible. interesting story. Yeah. I and mean, just kept him with him all the time. Yeah. <laughs> You know, keep them nice and warm. That's it. Feed them, keep them warm, and keep them dry. That's that's pretty much it. So that is that's incredible. What he did. So I think uh, that kind of ends our story. But again, if people are watching this, if they had any relatives or friends or anything that went up there, uh, at the end of the show here, I'll put the uh, phone number for the TV station and, or, and the email if they want to let us know. Give us a call. Because it would be, it's a really interesting uh, yeah, it is. And you know what? Thank you so much for going north to Alaska yes, with there us. Was, there was that John Wayne movie yes. called North to Alaska. And as I remember, that was not about the Klondike, but that was about Nome. When they yes. Came, when that next, yeah, yeah. But I remember that song, and I remember John Wayne, and... Uh, <laughs> A whole thing about going north to Alaska. And I guess there are still people up there besides big you know, yeah. mining companies right. that go out and actually you know, pan for gold, at least in the summer. Well, that would be kind of a fun little trip to see yeah. if you could find a few nuggets here or there. A little hobby. That's right. <laughs> so thank you very much for going along with us today on our trip up to uh, the gold fields of Alaska. And this has been the History, History Files. Files.